At this stage, we're going to direct our studies towards replication and the features provided by replication within MySQL. Most enterprise DBMSs support replication. It's the ability to designate one server as a master and to have that master server replicate databases, which includes tables, of course, to any number of slave servers defined within the master to slave relationship. So replication is all about replicating certain data sets from a master to n number of slaves. And within MySQL, there is no limit to the number of slaves in which you can replicate data to, so long as, of course, you have ample bandwidth and a sufficient budget for provisioning n number of systems, n could be as large as you want it to be. Let's go ahead and open our notes, and we're going to spend this section just discussing the rules behind implementing regulation, replication, replication that is, within replication. So let's go ahead and open a shell and open our notes so that we can discuss the features that are available to us and how replication is implemented. We're going to spend this section just covering the rules and in subsequent sections we'll cover actual implementation. Let's launch gedit. This will bring us into our notes and towards the bottom we'll write to the file a section called replication. So replication works primarily based on master to slave servers and can replicate any number of databases to any number of servers. It's a great way to improve the performance of your application, especially when your application relies primarily upon reads. If your application is write intensive, then replication may not be the best way for you to improve performance. Perhaps you would want to consider clustering rather than replication. But most web-based applications are read-only or for the most part read versus write and since the majority of requests to the database are read-based, replication can certainly increase performance. Especially of course if you configure your servers in such a way where you make use of content switches or load balancers, you certainly can increase the performance of your reads to your user community. So we're going to discuss replication and we want to launch open offices and press utility to discuss in further detail how replication works by modeling a typical master to two slave server relationship. So we'll create a blank presentation. We'll clear the slides window as well as the tasks window and simply begin drawing. So the master server is the primary server. This is where your data store is that you'd like to have replicated to any number of slave servers. So let's click on text and label this particular server master MySQL server. This is the server that houses the primary databases. So we should also say houses read write DBs. It's important that we mention that the master server houses the read-write copies of the DBs because the slave servers will not accept writes. They'll only accept reads unless, of course, there's a failover event where the administrator causes one of the slaves to become a writable server. But all writes should take place on the master server, and that's where you want things to occur. Not that it's impossible to write to a slave server, but you can affect negatively the synchronization of your replication setup if you allow writes to be performed on the slave servers. So ideally, you want to customize your application within a MySQL replication framework so that writes take place on the master server and reads can take place anywhere on any one of your servers. So let's go ahead and copy this particular object and once we have it copied we'll paste it twice to indicate our two slave servers. These are typical slave servers. In our environment we do have two slave servers but we'll just work with one to illustrate the concepts that we'd like to convey. So this particular box is considered a slave server. So this is a slave MySQL server and it houses 
read DBs, but it's also writable. But we want to treat slave servers as readable DBs rather than writable DBs. But it certainly is writable. And here's another slave server, which houses read copies of the databases that you're replicating from the primary. So now that we have this basic model, this tells us that there are three servers in the environment, master and two slaves. Let's discuss a little bit about how this replication works. First and foremost, there are connectors between the slaves and the master. So let's draw some lines to indicate that relationship. We're going to have connections between the two and on a recurring basis, and it's a definable basis, the servers, the slave servers that is, will attempt to communicate with the master server to download the latest copies of any databases that the master server is responsible for and will replicate to the slave servers. By default, all databases are replicatable, but you certainly can customize it. So on a recurring basis, slave servers attempt to connect to the master server to download the latest copy of the databases. Now on the master server there is one process that runs per slave server connected and that particular process shows up as the binary log dump process. So it either looks like bin log or binary log but when you do a show process list you'll see typically a bin log which is really short for binary log dump process. That implies that the master server records changes to the databases on their, its management or on its server using a binary logging format. So that tells us one thing. In order to enable replication we need to turn on or enable on the master server binary logging. So let's take some notes here. So note, binary logging must be enabled on the master server prior to replication. This is important because replication is premised on the binary logs that are created, which is the fastest way of logging for most applications. The master server will write to its binary log and the slave servers are responsible for downloading updates from the binary log stored on the master server. And again, as mentioned, there's a primary process which runs on the master server which handles replication and it's represented by a bin log dump process entry when you use the show process list command. So we should modify this particular text entry to indicate the name of the process that runs. So one process and its name typically appears as bin log dump. This is the name that you'll see when you execute a show process list. However, on the slave servers, two processes run to handle replication. So let's edit the slave servers to illustrate more clearly what actually occurs. So on this particular side, you have two processes. One is actually an IO thread for input output. So IO thread runs on the server and the other is called a SQL thread. So wherever you see thread, think process. We'll copy this particular text so that we can paste it over onto the other slave. And this is exactly what it looks like when it's up and running in production. So when you configure replication, you'll configure the master to be a master server and you'll enable binary logging which we'll show you and once binary logging and replication has been enabled the master server runs an, ex an extra process at all times unless the server has been stopped by the administrator or crashes it runs an extra process which appears in the process listing as bin log dump which by the way if we were to attempt to look at right now you wouldn't see it let's just mysql in as root and we want to be prompted for password of course and if we execute a show process list you'll see that the only thing running is the existing connection from the client to the server no bin log dump process for replication which means replication is not up and running but there are other ways to tell so the one process runs on the master and two separate processes run on the slave servers one's called the IO thread the other is called the SQL thread the IO thread 
is responsible for moving the data so it moves data it downloads the data from the master server so it's indicate that here as well that's its purpose is to move data it connects to the master server on a recurring basis and whenever there are updates to be downloaded downloads it to the local system into and the local system being a slave system into a temporary log file called a relay log file so the IO thread moves the information to a temporary log file we can use another object or another box to indicate that particular log file this will represent our log file here let's just make some text and we'll call it the log file the relay log file and we'll copy this particular object so that it's available to the other slave server as well let's paste it, it'll be pasted in exactly the same place so we'll move it over and we could draw a connector between the two but it should be self-explanatory so the IO thread is responsible for contacting the master and downloading updates to the databases under management on the master server and storing that information in the relay log file the SQL thread logically processes the local relay log file and as a result of processing that relay log file is able to keep the local slave instance up to date so it's a two-step process the IO thread gets the latest updates and the SQL thread processes those updates so two things are happening pretty much simultaneously and this allows room for errors such as failure or unanticipated failure let's say a loss in power if the IO thread moves the data independent of the thread that's responsible for inserting or applying the updates that are indicated in the relay log file so both slaves or n number of slaves manage two processes when replication is enabled and one of the processes the IO thread process is responsible for moving the data into the relay log file the SQL thread which is the second process is responsible for processing the SQL statement stored in the file now the relay log file is actually represented by two files let's extend the length of this particular relay log object to indicate what those two files are one is called hostname underscore or host underscore name dash relay dash bin dot a series of ends which really is an integer which is based at one and this is the actual relay bin file that's or the relay file that's populated it's a binary file populated by the IO thread and actually processed by the SQL thread so this is the primary data file there's a secondary file which is called the index file and the index file helps the process to know exactly where it left off so there's another file called host underscore name dash relay dash bin dot index and the index file does exactly what its name implies which is to index exactly where the any of the processes have left off in the main file so the relay log file is really represented by two files on the file system once replications up and running hostname relay bin as well as hostname relay bin dot index and the bin file the initial file has a series of ends which really represent an integer which is based as based at the integer number one when replications up and running and by the way once replication has occurred successfully the log file is erased or both log files the index and the bin files are erased and new log files are created upon subsequent connections so for example when a slave connects to the master and downloads all of the changes the two files are created and once the changes have been committed to the local slave the local slaves processes will remove the bin file as well as the index file and when new changes are to be committed to the local instance of the database then two new files will be created as a result so the process is very very simple and straightforward to understand let's go ahead and save this particular file which will be included on the DVD we'll export it to PDF and this particular file will simply be once we place it in our home directory Linux CBT DBMS edition and this is the replication model and it's a PDF file so we'll save it 
export all pages and out of PDFs available. Very simple logic. But again, this now means that we'll need to configure on the master replication so that the one process, the bin log dump process, will execute and then pick one of our servers to operate as a slave server. And we'll do so for, for the HR database. And of course, we will have to commit changes to the HR database to see them actually replicated to the slave server. So what else can we say about the replication process that's of assistance? Well, we know that binary logging must be enabled on the master server. Another note is that two processes will execute on each slave server to handle replication. Note, one process will execute on the master server per slave server. That's important to understand because again back to our model. In this model we have two slave servers connecting to the master server. This means that there will be two bin log dump processes executing on the master server to handle the two slave servers. If, you're, if you only have one slave server, then there's only one bin log dump process running on the master. So there are n number of bin log dump processes for n number of slave servers. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. So that's a little bit about the processing, the technicalities of how the threads are instantiated to handle the replication process. What else should you know about replication? Replication is asynchronous. asynchronous. So note, Replication is asynchronous, which means that changes are committed to one node and then replicated at a later time. Even if the time is separated by seconds, it isn't synchronous, it isn't automatic. Changes are sent to one place or updates are sent to one place and then committed or propagated to n number of slaves, which means that it's asynchronous. So the data isn't available immediately. It may be close to immediately based on the performance of your network as well as systems. So if you have fast systems and a fast network, then the changes may be propagated very, very quickly. And also considering if your data sets aren't terribly large, then asynchronous may be very close to synchronous. But you should know that, again, replication is asynchronous. And you should know that updates should be made on the master server. So note, updates must be made on the master server. It's not entirely true, but logically that's how you should set up your environment to avoid going out of synchronization or to lose synchronization, to avoid losing synchronization between the master and the slave servers. And replication is ideal for non-updating queries. So it's really ideal for non-updating queries as is the case with many web applications. So if you have environments where many reads or the ratio of reads to writes is much, much greater than writes to reads, then replication may work well because front-end applications such as web servers can take advantage of the fact that the any of the slave servers can respond to a query because reads are considered to be much, much faster than writes logically of course. Super. So next we're going to discuss some more of the features of MySQL's replication and we'll also get into configuring it to see how it actually works. Let's proceed with our replication configuration. Thus far you know that a master server needs to be configured and any number of slaves can be configured, but what exactly is the process for defining this relationship between at least one master and a slave. Well, we're going to go through those steps right now. First and foremost, we want to confirm that binary logging is configured on the master server. Without binary logging, replication does not work. So let's go to our notes and label this section steps for configuring replication between master and one slave. And once we've gone through these steps, you can repeat them for n number of slaves without repeating the master portion. 
we're going to list the steps using a number number bullet to indicate the order in which you should perform these steps. So these bulleted numbers represent the order that you should follow. So step one, confirm that binary logging is configured on the master server. This is very important because again without binary logging replication does not work. So in order to confirm it we're going to go to the shell and first and foremost we'll quit and we'll just take a brief look after su in. We'll need added privileges or increased privileges. So let's su in and navigate into var lib mysql. If binary logging is configured you'll find in the varlib mysql directory which happens to be the data directory files similar to the syntax that we've or similar to the nomenclature that we've mentioned we mentioned that the files are usually named as follows hostname dash relay bin dot a series of numbers hostname dash relay bin index to indicate which log file is in use so if you don't see files with a prefix of hostname followed by relay one with numbers at the end or for using representing the suffix and another with index representing the suffix chances are likely that binary logging is not configured but there are better ways to confirm because you could easily specify that binary logging is to be enabled using any file name that you'd like and it may not necessarily be stored in varlib mysql although this is the default location for storing files the easiest way is to execute a MySQL D and turn on the verbose help option. This will reveal the variables that were set when the MySQL server started. If we dump this to screen, this is a lot of information to process, but you're really looking for the log binary section to see whether or not it's turned on. So again, it dumps all of these variables to screen very quickly, but you're interested in the log-bin value being set. There is no default values. In other words, the default RPM binary package that we installed earlier to enable MySQL 5.x on this system does not enable binary logging by default, which means we need to turn it on. Because if we don't turn it on, replication doesn't work. So let's go ahead and show you how you turn it on. You're simply going to copy this directive and place it into the etc my.cnf file. And let's go ahead and use pico to modify etc my.cnf and we'll place it beneath the mysql d section notice there is no mysql d section or mysql d group so we'll just create a group called mysql d the mysql daemon also reads other groups including server so we could have created a group called server as well we'll simply specify log dash bin now if you follow this with an equal symbol followed by a name the MySQL daemon will create the binary log using the name after the equal sign. So don't specify a name if you want to use the default, which is what we want to do. We'll simply specify log-bin, which tells the server to default to the names that we've specified here, which in includes the host underscore name, which is linuxcbtdb one relay bin dot integer, as well as host underscore name, which is linuxcbtdb one relay bin dot index. So we'll simply use the default by turning on logging binary. We're going to come back to this file soon enough to include one other directive that's important for enabling replication and that's the server ID. We could put it in now but we'll just go with the recommended steps which is to turn on binary logging. Once binary logging is turned on we can restart the server. So let's go ahead and execute an RC MySQL stop followed by a start which effectively restarts the server and what you'll notice is that in the varlib mysql data directory are new files including linuxcbtdb1 which is the hostname dash bin dot index and linuxcbtdb1 dash bin dot integer this tells us that binary logging is configured because it's using the default names the index file tells mysql which log file it's using and the position that it left off in and so forth or the offset now we may re-enter mysql we'll prompt for password and then connect and once in 
we'll be able to execute a command called show master status. Let's execute show master status. This command tells us which binary log file is currently being used by MySQL and its current offset. This is very important. We need to record these two pieces of information because we'll need to provide the slave when we configure it with both pieces of information. And for n number of slaves, we'll have to repeat these steps. So record these bits of information, these pieces of information, but we'll do that later on. Just know that we'll need to reference these two pieces of information when configuring n number of slaves. So now that we're back in, we need to use the grant command. So the next step is we want to grant the replication right to a specific user. And that is a user that we're going to configure on n number of slaves, n being one for now. So step two is to we've already confirmed that binary logging is turned on and we did so by modifying or we modified etc my.cnf to include log dash bin that's all one directive and then we entered mysql and executed a show master status this told us that binary logging is enabled when binary logging is disabled you will see no such output. It will simply return zero rows. So step two, once we've configured binary logging, is to create a replication account. So let's label this as create replication account. All slaves will use the replication account to connect to the server. So we'll connect to each slave and configure them with the replication account as well as the binary log file name as well as the offset so that when they connect to the master server they're able to download from the proper offset within the log file. An offset is just a location within the log file, the binary log file that is, where the slave should begin downloading information. An offset could be line 10, could be line 30, in this case it's position 98 if you recall from the output. So let's return to our text file and continue our discussion here. So we want to create a replication account you should be quite comfortable with the grant command and that is exactly what we'll use to grant the replication privilege so we're going to grant replication slave on now if you want to only permit the replication of a specific DB specify the DB such as hr.star otherwise if you want to replicate the entire server simply specify star.star .star. It's up to you. You can grant replication on a per user basis. You can also create individual users who are able to replicate only specific databases. So let's go ahead with hr.star2 and we'll create an account called replica. We'll call this replica hr. And replica hr will be at any host, so we'll simply specify a percent indicating any host. And of course, we want to identify this particular user by a specific password. So we'll identify by, or specify that the user is identified by the password in between the single quotes, ABC123, just for simplicity. So we're granting replication slave on hr.star. There are some additional rights that we need to grant if we intend for our replication user to be able to use load data from and load tables from. Those are select, super, and reload rights. So you may want to consider also granting select, super, and reload on the database that you'd want to permit replication to a given slave. So we'll grant these also on hr.star. We could have included these rights all in one line, but just for clarity, we'll do it on separate lines. So this is for hr.star to the same user. So the user will be permitted the ability to select and super and reload on hr.star. Because again, there is optional syntax which allows us to load data using the load data statement or the load table statement. So something else to keep in mind, but the basic rights that are required includes the first line grant replication slave because we're going to show you how to back up the databases in binary format then we'll use one of the SSH utilities SCP to copy the file from our local system over to the remote system and then import the data files and then perform replication super so let's go ahead and grant the 
or create the replication account by granting it the replication slave permission or privilege. We'll go to the shell and we'll paste this command as root of course. Now in this case an error was thrown and we can rectify that error by changing hr.star to simply star.star and it will change the account from replica hr to replica and try it again and we'll paste it and this time it was taken so chances are there's some sort of small bug that may be addressable via a soon to be published update so we're gonna switch from granting to a specific database to all databases by granting on star.star .star, which we have and now we have the new user created let's go ahead and grant the additional privileges in the event that we want to use the load data and load tables commands for moving data across and those rights have been granted as well. So if we execute a show grants for the user, in fact we specify the user's replica HR, so we'll redefine the user as replica. Let's just move that HR and try that again. And if we execute show grants for the user replica you'll see that the user has been granted select, reload, super, replication, slave on all of the databases that are under management by this particular DBMS. So we've created the replication account, albeit it has access to all of the databases, and that's step two. Step three is to commit all changes to the tables on the file system so that when we back it up, we have captured all of the changes. In order to commit all changes to the files, the table data files on the file system, we need to flush the tables. And we also need to restrict writes to the tables so that when we back up the tables, we're sure that no one's performing any writes. Again, we're operating under the assumption that many users are connected to the system and we want to set up replication as quickly as possible while preserving data integrity. So step three is to flush all tables and block writes to restrict changes during replication configuration. In order to perform a flush and to block all writes we simply execute flush tables with read lock. This applies to MyISM tables, which are the default table types. If you use InnoDB for your tables, then consult the reference manual for more information on how to flush and commit all rights to those types of tables. But if you're using the default MyISM, which most installations do, just simply flush the tables with read lock, and this will permit the changes we want. To terminate this with a semicolon and attempt to execute it on the server and once we've effected these changes then we'll be able to back up the entire subdirectory and copy it across to the remote system so let's go to the shell and control shift V to flush all tables with read lock and providing there are no errors returned we've successfully completed step 3 which means we can now move on to step 4 which is to make the binary copy of the database so that we can transport it to the remote system. So let's recap the steps before we move on to the next section. When setting up replication, you must confirm that your primary server has binary logging enabled. This is absolutely important. And we do so by checking in the data directory varlib mysql for the presence of binary log files. We also consult the mysql d daemon turning on verbose output by executing mysqld let's show you that syntax mysqld verbose help and you simply grep for log bin to determine whether or not binary logging is enabled a show master status will also tell you whether or not binary logging is enabled when it's disabled zero records are returned so after you've confirmed that binary logging is properly configured, if you need to make changes to the my.cnf file, you do so, then restart the server and you've confirmed it. 
then you move on to creating a replication account. We had a little difficulty setting up an account restricted to a specific DB, so we granted replication slave on all databases. And we also granted additional privileges, select, super, reload, on all databases in the event that the remote slave wants to perform additional functions. So once we've created an account solely for the purpose of performing replication, in other words, connecting from the slaves to the primary or the master for downloading updates, step three is to freeze the tables that are under management by MySQL across all databases. We do so by flushing them and restricting writes. And the command that we use to, to effect this change is the flush tables with read lock command. So now we're at a state because as long as this client connection remains open to the server, no one can write to any of the tables under management by MySQL. So we're at a state now where we can back up using a simple command such as tar, so a binary backup of the database that we want to replicate, and then copy it to the remote system. Let's move on to the next step in configuring replication and that's step four. As you can see we still have a client connection open to the server which means that the most recently run command flush tables with read lock is still in effect which means that users currently cannot make changes to any of the tables under management. So you want to do this as quickly as possible or perhaps off peak. So step four is to make a binary copy or a binary backup of the database directory. So step four make a binary backup of the database directory. In this case we're interested in replicating the HR database. So what we're going to do is use the tar command followed by the CJVF options which will create a tarred image using bzip version 2 compression of var lib and we'll give it a name of hr.bz2 but we're going to back up var lib mysql hr. So we're going to copy this command again cjvf this is a simple tar command which will create a tarred bzip version 2 image of the var lib mysql hr directory and all of its subdirectories so it is recursive. So let's leave this session open control shift T and SU in as root. We don't want to close the original session because we want to freeze changes to the tables. As long as that session's open, that will be the case. We'll let you in and then navigate to varlib mysql where you'll see many files including the binary log file, the index file, and a top level directory for HR. Now HR doesn't contain much information so if we execute a DUCH on HR it should return not much at all. It's only 6.7 megabytes. So when we compress it using bzip version 2 compression, it should be backed up very quickly. So let's go ahead and back it up by pasting, and this will create a file in the current directory. And once written, we'll have the file here, and we are assured that no changes were made during the backup of the HR table or HR database that is so no tables were changed within the HR database. This particular file can be copied to n number of slaves and then configured for replication. So we want to move this file over to the remote system. So step five is to get the file over to the remote system. So we want to copy the binary backup to the remote system. Now we could have backed up all databases if we wanted to back up or if we wanted to perform replication for all databases managed by the MySQL instance we could have just backed up the entire MySQL tree. Sometimes that's reasonable or feasible if you don't have any special accounts for example defined on a remote system. But other times you want to simply back up specific databases and replicate just those specific databases. But you could have just as easily created a backup of the entire varlib MySQL subdirectory, copied it to the remote system, and then begun replication. And you would effectively have mirrored servers. 
So this step we want to copy the binary file to the remote system. We'll use SCP followed by hr.bz2 and then copy it over to the server Linux CBT Media 1. Linux CBT Media 1 will function as our first slave box. So we want to copy it over there into its varlib mysql subdirectory so that when we extract it, it extracts the hr top level directory beneath varlib mysql on a remote system. So let's copy this and we'll ensure that our host knows who Linux CBT Media 1 is. We'll ping it sending three packets and if it knows it will respond and it does. Let's attempt to copy the file and it prompts for password and providing we authenticate correctly the file will be copied and it has been. Now we need to connect to the remote system and we'll do so from this existing window by SSHing in as root over to Linux CBT Media 1. Once there, which we will be momentarily, we'll then navigate to varlib mysql where you'll find the file that we just copied, hr.bz2. Notice that there are other databases defined, but none of them are hr. So we can now extract this particular file on the remote system, creating the same top level structure. So let's go ahead and extract it. We'll tar xzvf, and by the way, it's a good idea to have MySQL stopped on the remote system. So let's just go ahead and execute them RC MySQL stop. And RC, by the way, is specific to SUSE. So if you're using a different distribution, just use the script that will stop the process, whether it's simply executing etc init d MySQL stop, or if you're within a distribution such as Red Hat using service, just stop the process and then continue your work. We'll tar xjvf hr.bz2, and this will create the structure that we want. And notice it created var, we, so it backed up the full tree. We wanted it to create hr. Let's take a look at var. We'll move it out of var. So we'll move var, and that's because of the way we created the tar image, so it preserved the var lib mysql structure. So we'll simply move var lib mysql hr into this directory and now HR is in here and we can remove VAR. So that was just an issue with using TAR to back up the HR directory. Let's take a look and now we have HR and an LSLTR of HR reveals all the tables and if we execute a DU against HR it should return the same size 6.7 megs and that's correct. But more importantly we want to be sure that the files that are owned especially the table data files are owned by the MySQL user because when we perform replication MySQL runs as a user call MySQL and will need proper privileges to be able to update the table data. Great, so all of these files appear to the exception of the text files that we created for import all of the table data files appear to be owned by MySQL so the remote instance of or the slave instance of MySQL should have no problems reading and writing to the files. So now that this is all in place, it's time to record the current binary file name and the offset. So we're going to officially, in step six, record the master server's binary log file, well, binary log file name and offset because we'll need to program this information into each slave that we configure. So on the master, we simply execute a show master status, which should be in our history. And once executed, here's the file name that we'll need. That's for the log file. And notice that the position has changed from 98 to 491. So the file name is equal to what we've just pasted and the offset is equivalent to 491. We can run it again just to confirm because it's important that the slave knows exactly where to begin downloading changes to the database. Great, so this is in place, step six taken care of, and once step six is out of the way, we are free to actually release the lock that we have on the table. So at this stage, we can release the lock, which will allow connected users to update the tables within the HR database if necessary. 
but this is something we can do at this stage. So let's go ahead and do that. So step seven is to release the lock on the tables. And we do so by using simply an unlock tables command. This permits writes to the tables. Reads are always permitted, but writes are not. We'll go ahead and execute that unlock tables. And now the tables have been unlocked and we're free to remove ourselves from this session and know that we can proceed with configuring replication on the slave and download the, the changes accordingly. Now we've yet to configure a server ID on the master. Neither have we con configured one for the slave. So step eight is to configure server IDs for both master and slave servers. And in order to do so, simply use your favorite editor, such as VI, Pico, or Nano. We'll use Pico because it's available. We'll modify the my.cnf file located in etc. And we're going to place in it a directive called server-id, setting it to a value that is between 1 and 2 to the 32nd, or about 4 billion minus 1. So to recap, the server ID for the master, usually in most documentation for MySQL, is usually indicated as 1, but it can be any value within this 4 billion space, 2 to the 32nd. So you could make it 100, 100,000, whatever you want, as long as it's unique, and each node participating in the replication framework has a unique ID, there should be no problems whatsoever. We're going to go ahead and follow the typical syntax, which is to set server ID equal to 1, and for each slave, we'll configure higher values such as 100. So server ID for the master, and we should indicate that this is for the master. So master server ID, and we'll set our first slave server ID equal to 100. Let's go ahead and copy this directive. And once we've set this directive, we'll need to restart MySQL, which is a brief operation. So locally we'll quit and then modify using pico etc my.cnf. We need to specify this directive beneath the MySQLD section or a section that's processed by MySQLD. It doesn't have to be the MySQLD group, but since it exists, we'll use it. We'll save it. And by the way, if you execute a MySQLD verbose followed by help and then pipe it to less, you'll see soon enough which files are processed by MySQL, the server, the daemon. It reads sections with the names MySQLD or server or MySQLD-5.0. So if any of these sections exist in any of the files that are parsed by default, which includes etcmy.cnf or the user's home directory and the hidden file .my.cnf, then the directives beneath the section will be processed. So that's something to keep in mind so that if there are problems or missing directives or variables set or unset, you know where you need to debug and you know that using MySQLD with the verbose and help options will tell you which files you'll need to debug in the event that you have a problem or just simply need to set a variable. So we've set it for the server but we need to restart the server. So let's RC MySQL stop and then RC MySQL start and now the server ID will be set to 1 and you can always echo any exit status after running a process within a Nix based box to ensure that it was run successfully but the done that's echo to the right usually indicates that the return value was 0 and meaning that it was successful so we need to go ahead and set the server ID for the slave and for each slave or for each system participating in replication ensure that the server IDs are unique so let's just put a note which says each MySQL server participating in replication requires a unique server ID then on the slave which we have open in a separate window will simply pico etc my.cnf notice in this case it doesn't even exist mysql the daemon starts with certain defaults so there is no hard requirement for a configuration file 
If it doesn't exist, create it. So we'll create one and create the section that's read by the server. As you know, MySQLD is read by the server, so we'll just define a section called MySQLD. And we'll specify the server ID to be 100. Now you may be wondering, does the or do slave servers need to be configured with configured with the binary logging feature? And the answer is they don't. Unless your slave server is going to function as a master server for other slave servers, which is basically a chaining configuration, you don't need to turn on binary logging for the slave servers. They simply need to cross-reference the master server, which has binary logging configured. So only one server needs to have binary logging turned on, and that's the master server. Slave servers simply are configured with server IDs. So let's save the changes here. And once the server ID is configured, then we're free to move on with our configuration. So, so far we've gone through eight steps to configure replication. It's not as complicated as it seems, it's pretty straightforward, but you just need to know the steps that are required. Once the server ID is programmed into the slave, we can actually start the slave server and then configure the replication parameters. So, on the remote side, let's RC MySQL. We'll stop it first and start it. As you can see, there's no PID found indicating that it was already stopped. So we'll start it. And once it's up and running, we'll connect to it. We'll prompt. And once in, we will then execute the commands that configures the replication. And there are a series of commands. So let's just label this section as step 9. Step 9 is to start the slave server and configure replication and there again are a series of commands that we need to specify we start by setting the master server to a specified host name or IP address if you go at host name just put the host name in your hosts file to ensure that the resolution is always available and you can confirm that by going to the shell so let's just quit momentarily and attempting to ping, sending a few packets to Linux CVT DB1, which is the primary server. Once you know it's able to find it, we should be fine. Let's grep Linux CVT DB1 from ETC hosts. We want to ensure that name resolution is good, and it's in the hosts file, so it should always be able to find the primary server or the master server. So let's return into MySQL. And once there, we'll configure the directives that are left to effect replication. So we're going to change the master to master underscore host. And we'll set master underscore host equivalent to Linux CBT DB1. That's the first step. But we still have some other variables that need to be set. We need to define a master user. And all of this is one SQL statement that will be executed. So don't specify the semicolon until the end. Master user is equal to replica. We need to set a master password, which you know is ABC123. And again, step number nine, as well as step number eight, or at least the second half of step eight, which is to configure the slave's server ID. And step number nine is to be performed on all slave servers. Master password. We'll set it equivalent to ABC123. We also need to specify the master log file. The master log file is what we recorded earlier, so let's just copy it now so that we may indicate to the slave which file is the master binary log file that's in use by the server. So let's go ahead and specify that directive as master underscore log underscore file, and in between single quotes, we'll specify the name as db1-bin all zeros 1 and then we need to specify the offset as a separate value and a separate using a separate directive so master log position is that directive we'll set it equivalent to the position that we recorded which is 491 that we'll just simply type in this is the full command so let's just recap what needs to be programmed into each slave server in addition to this, a unique server ID, which you should keep track of, perhaps in a spreadsheet or a text file, 
we need to execute a change master to master host. Now this particular change master command can be run on any slave in the event that the slave loses connectivity to the master. Let's say the master server crashes or fails or loses power or is purposely shut and you want to define one of your slaves as a master server. So in our model here the master server vanishes we could redefine one of the slaves as a master and then repoint a surviving slave to the new master using the change master command that we have just typed in. By specifying change master to master host followed by the user, the password, the log file, and the position, we would have effectively configured replication on the client. So here's the user replica, and this must all match what was configured on the server. So let's go ahead and copy this entire block, and then we'll paste it into the slave, and once pasted, the slave is configured for replication. So now that the slave is configured for replication, our next step is to go through and begin making changes to the master database and see them updated on the slave database or the slave server. Now that we've configured our replication environment, we need to start the slave server to begin the replication process. By virtue of executing the change master to master host followed by the other variables such as master user password, master log, and so forth, we've basically instructed the server to be a slave server, but we haven't actually started or begun the process. To begin the process, execute a start slave. And on subsequent starts of MySQL, it will automatically attempt to be a slave server. Now when you do attempt to execute start slave, it returns zero rows and we need to debug to determine whether or not the server is truly up and running as a slave. Now we have multiple commands that can help us to determine if replication is up and running. Starting with show slave status. So let's get start slave over. Step 10 is start slave server and confirm replication. The first command is simply start slave and on subsequent starts again of MySQL replication will begin automatically and in fact you'll have to use a directive explicitly in the my.cnf or on the command line or in one of the options files to instruct the server to not be a slave server upon starting. Once that server ID is configured MySQL will attempt to become a slave, ser slave server for a master server. So we've started slave and now we want to see the status of the slave by executing a show slave status similar to show master status. Again these commands are case insensitive. We specify an uppercase usually just for readability. Let's execute it and what we're looking for are the columns where the MySQL server indicates that the processes for IO as well as for SQL are running. Notice that there's a column it's called slave underscore IO underscore state. And notice it says that it's for the first column waiting for master to send event, which usually indicates that it's up and running and is communicating with the master server. The very next column is the master host. This is all information that we specified in our recent change master to master host command. So it's maintained within the memory of the MySQL slave server. The port defaults to 3306. The connection retry is set to every 60 seconds. In the event that the slave is unable to connect to the server, to the master server, it retries every 60 seconds. The name of the log file, which is now 0002, or many zeros followed by 2. The position is set to 98, although we specified 491. The relay log file is this file. As we mentioned, each slave will maintain a relay log file as well as a relay log index file. So within our show slave status output, we see the name of the current relay log file, which gets purged after all updates have been committed to the slave server. And there are other interesting columns, including the relay master log file, the file on the server, slave IO running, is currently set to yes. That's one of two important processes executed by replication on the slave. And slave SQL running, yes. So both processes are running. 
We could also output this information by executing show process lists. But again, the two important processes run by a slave server include the I.O. and the SQL processes. The I.O. process is responsible for moving the data from the master and the SQL process is responsible for processing the data that's moved by the I.O. process. The I.O. process moves the data into relay bin. SQL processes processes this, this particular file and commits the SQL statements into the local databases. Now initially we set out to replicate only the HR database but in reality the ideal configuration is to replicate all databases because if updates are to be made on the primary server including users who are granted access to any of the DBs then perhaps that information should be replicated to slave servers as well. For example, if you define a new user on the master server, that new user should also be defined on each slave server in the event that the client, whether it be the client is an application or a physical user, attempts to connect to the slave for reading data rather than the master server, the user is able to authenticate, providing that replication has occurred. So it's ideal that you replicate all databases, not just one database, although it is possible to replicate specific databases. Notice there are also directives for SSL. Version 5.x of MySQL supports replication via SSL so that the SQL statements that are in the binary file can be transmitted in an encrypted fashion between server and or master server and slave servers. So let's look at that next command, show process list, which we've run before since we've looked at show slave status. Show process list will reveal, in addition to the current connection to the server, the two processes that are running, one for I.O. and the other for the SQL process. Here's the thread has already or has read all relay log waiting for the slave I.O. thread to update it. This is a SQL thread and another one waiting for the master server to send an event. So as far as this slave server is concerned, the binary backup of the HR database is identical to what's on the server, the master server. There are no changes, there have been no changes, and it's accurate. If we do go ahead and make a change on the primary side, however, it will be replicated as soon as possible to the slave, and we'll be able to query the slave directly to see those updates. So some of the commands that help us to determine whether or not a slave server is up and running include start slave, well start slave actually starts the slave server, but show slave status will reveal many useful columns including whether or not the IO and or SQL processes are running. And show process lists will also tell us whether or not the IO and or SQL processes are running. We may also confirm from the file system. So another thing we can do is confirm the existence of relay log and index files in data directory. So basically for this task what we want to do is just take a look at var lib mysql. Let's take a look at it from the shell and we'll see that these files are there will connect from a separate window. In fact, this this window will suffice. We'll paste it. And notice that this particular directory contains the bin file. In fact, this is on a server, so we need a separate window here. We'll quit this existing session and we'll paste the command. You'll see the relay file momentarily. There it is. Here's the relay bin file and here's the or the index file and here's the relay bin. The relay bin is the intermediary file which accepts updates from the master server. The index file instructs MySQL as to which relay binary file is the current file. So these two files exist. So we've confirmed them. Another thing that we can do to determine whether or not a slave server is up and running is to confirm the existence of master.info and you'll see momentarily relay log.info files again in the data directory in data directory let's take a look at the data directory notice that 
the master.info file exists and the relay-log.info files both exist. Both files are not to be tampered with and are used by MySQL for certain things such as who's the master server and what's going on with the relay log file. Let's take a look at them. They're both ASCII text files. We'll execute a file against star.info, but we won't change them. And then we'll cat master.info since it's only 72 bytes. Notice it contains in clear text the name of the binary file that's currently in use on the master server, the offset, the name of the server, the account, the password, the port, and the retry interval every set to every 60 seconds. Let's cat the relay-log.info file and this also contains offset information and the name of the binary file on the master server. So in the event that there's a power outage or a loss of connectivity, MySQL when restarted will consult master.info and relay-log.info to determine which files, which servers, which usernames and passwords to use to re-establish the replication process. So, so far so good. Things look like they're in place. We have our intermediary file, the index file, and we also have master and relay log info files. So, so far it seems as if we've been successful with setting, setting up replication on this server, which means we could copy this hr.bz2 or perform a new snapshot on the remote master server and perform the replication configuration on subsequent slave systems. The only thing is when you do take a snapshot you do need to freeze the tables. So if you do intend to take a new snapshot, return to the notes and freeze the tables using a flush tables with read lock. Only after you've executed the flush tables with read lock, especially for my ISM type tables, can you then go and back up all of the database directories. And in this case we did HR, but you could do the entire directory tree and copy it over to the slave server and then continue with configuring replication after you've unlocked the tables. So what this means is now that we can make changes on the master server and watch them replicate to the slave. But before doing so, let's connect to the slave and perform some queries just to see that the table data at least looks the same on the surface. So on the slave server, we'll MySQL in and prompt for a password. And once connected, we'll show databases to be sure that the HR database shows up. And there it is. If you recall, we didn't use a create database DDL command. So it's there. We'll use HR. And let's show tables within HR. Here are the tables. We'll select star from employees. And you'll see the list of four users. And this is, again, all on the slave server. So what we should do is confirm this on the master server, which is our primary box. So let's connect to the master server in a separate window. We'll show databases. We'll essentially run the same sequence of commands the same series of commands. We'll use HR, show tables. The same tables are listed and we can just confirm it one more time. There are five tables and on this side here are five tables as well. Let's select star from employees and we should see the same list of four employees. And so far so good. So again at this stage we're ready to confirm replication. So step 11 and the final step is confirm replication by effecting changes to the master read write DBMS. So we want to run either an update or an insert statement. So we're going to insert into employees a new employee. And we're going to set certain columns, the required columns. Again, we're doing this on the master purposely because replication is master to slave based. So let's go ahead we're going to describe employees and see which fields are required. We need first name, last name. So let's go ahead and construct that statement. We need date of birth, email, start date, and pay scale ID. So we'll insert into employees setting F name equivalent to a new F name followed by L name which is required 
followed by DOB. Let's specify that as 1960. And we'll specify the next required field. Let's just confirm what else is required after DOB. Email start date. So let's set email equivalent to the user's email. Followed by start date. And we should separate this just for readability. So let's set start date equivalent to 2003 03 033. That should be fine. And the final required field is payscale ID. The rest will be provided by the database for us. So payscale ID equivalent to, let's go at 15, and this should be a legitimate insert statement for a new employee. Let's go ahead and execute this again. You want to be sure that you're on the master. This is unlike MySQL clustering where you can perform the updates on either server. Again, you can perform updates on a MySQL slave server, but replication won't work because replication is based on master to slave or one-way replication. It is quite possible to configure two-way replication, but it isn't guaranteed and it's unsupported. For two-way replication, consider using MySQL clustering or just use one-way replication and force all of your changes to occur on the master. So let's control shift V to insert this new record and we'll select star from employees. You'll see that a new entry has been inserted. It's up to five from four so obviously the company is growing. Now what we need to confirm is that the data exists over on the slave side now, because this is such a little or a small amount of information, we won't get to see the processes on the slave server, both I.O. and SQL, change in between the states because it's a little bit of information. But had we updated the primary server with more information, let's say megs or gigabytes worth of information, then we'd be able to watch the slave server transition between its different states. Well, we won't be able to catch the server in its states. You may be able to in your environment. So let's confirm that the slave server has picked up on these changes. So in a separate window, we'll just go over and select star. Notice in our recent run, the number of rows returned was equivalent to four. Let's rerun the same query and notice that it's five. So all within the span of about two seconds or so, the changes have been replicated to the slave server. So replication is up and running, it's functional, and we can configure replication on additional servers and be assured that the information will be copied to those additional slave servers. We're going to test some additional features of replication and while doing so, we're going to also configure on an, another slave host, which is the second slave represented in our model, configure replication for that second slave as well. So we'll ultimately have two slaves replicating from one master. We've gone ahead and set up MySQL 5018 on the new host. So we'll just configure our host file to represent that new system. Let's SUN and pico etc hosts where we'll include a new host called Linux CBT serve one and its IP address is 192.168.1.10 we'll include both long and short names and once this is in we'll move on to testing our additional replication features and then move on to configuring replication on the new system let's save the changes and if we ping sending three packets to Linux CBT serve one, you'll see it responds. Great. Now what are the additional things we want to test? Let's just label the section test replication features. Let's test, for example, adding a new user to the master server. So we're going to add new users to master server and then confirm replication to slave system. 
Let's save the changes. Now let's confirm what's currently in place. We'll select user comma host comma password from mysql.user and it returns the users who are able to communicate with the system including one user who we should drop, replica HR. In fact, let's go ahead and drop that user. That's a test of replication. So we have two roots, one Linux CBT, replica HR, and replica. Let's confirm that these users exist on the slave system. In a separate shell, we'll execute the same query and notice that you see the user's root, but no Dean or, or no replica HR, but you do see Dean and other users. So the users don't exist. We'll drop the user from this side. And because we didn't replicate the database anyway, the MySQL database, but it will be replicated momentarily. We'll go ahead and drop user replica HR since it's not being used and an update will show that only replica exists but there's nothing to be updated on the remote side let's select HR or select users from MySQL user that is user host password we happen to be in the context of HR so so far no big deal but what if we went ahead and added a new user let's go ahead and define a new user by using the grant command so we'll grant all on star dot star to a new user defined as simply Dean. Dean exists on a remote system. Let's double check that. So let's go ahead and define a different name. We'll use a name such as Latte. Identified by password followed by the password. Let's go to password of simply ABC123. and this expects the hash will just drop the password keyword and now it's been configured so a select user will show the new user now we want to go ahead and confirm the presence of the new user and you'll notice that the user will not exist because we didn't replicate the MySQL database so let's go ahead and select the user and notice no username latte because we didn't replicate this database so in order to affect changes for databases you need to replicate those databases and you need to initially have taken a binary snapshot or somehow have exported the source databases to the slave server in this case we didn't but we could go ahead and alter our configuration and it adds practice anyway so what we want to do is on this, the master server just go through some of the steps that are required for doing replication we already have the user in place so we can skip that step let's scroll up back to step one we've already created the user we've confirmed binary logging we've created the user we need to flush tables with read lock this will ensure that only the read privilege will be permitted anywhere on this database or anywhere in any of the databases managed by the server. So now we've flushed with read lock. Step four is to back up the binary database. So we'll just back up, but this time we're going to back up the entire tree. So let's go to the shell and in a window that's available, let's find a free window where we are root. We'll navigate to varlib mysql and here are all the databases. So we'll simply tar cjvf and we can call this particular structure all dbs.bz2 as an example causing all these databases to end up in a file that will get extracted on the remote side we don't need to back up any of the binary log or index files but we can exclude them when we extract them to the remote system so we'll remove before we create the new image let's just remove hr.bz2 and then we'll tar cjvf we'll call it all underscore dbs dot bz2 and it'll back up everything into this one file recursively of course once this file is created let's just confirm its size it's only 1.2 megs and can confirm the contents of the file by doing a tar tzvf or tjvf that is all underscore dbs this should reveal all of the subdirectories and we'll see that the MySQL directory is backed up and so forth contact HR etc so now we have this file this is the entire structure let's copy it 
all DBs over to Linux CBT media one into var lib mysql of course we'll be prompted and we'll authenticate now the files on the remote side so we've taken care of freezing and we've copied the file over so we're already down to step six we need to note the file which is revealed using a show master status and we're going to record this for usage we're going to update this particular information since it would have changed by now so locally if we execute a show master status you'll see that the current file is different and the current offset is different it's 895 instead of the recent 491 so we'll set this to 895 and update the file to just be simply 2 we've backed up the tables so we're free now to unlock the tables so that updates may take place so let's go ahead and do that unlock tables because we've taken our snapshot so we really locked just to take the snapshot we have the snapshot now on the remote system we're going to quit and we will stop MySQL altogether so let's go ahead and execute an RC MySQL stop because we're going to extract the contents of the file over to the remote system we've already configured my.cnf the server IDs are all present so really all we need to do is just rerun the change master command after we've extracted the snapshot so really going through the steps a second time is very simple so now that we're here in varlib mysql we have all underscore dbs dot bz2 we're free to remove everything here and extract all underscore dbs dot bz2 the easiest and cleanest way to do this so that the servers are identical is to move all dbs one level up and after having done that then remove everything from this particular directory so we'll remove our f star cleaning out all databases on the secondary server now we'll move all DBs back into this directory and then extract it. So we'll tar xjvf all DBs. This will recreate the directory tree, including a snapshot of each database configured on the primary. Now we have an actual snapshot of everything on the remote side. But recall, we don't need the binary log file. So let's get rid of anything with DB1 in it. It's unnecessary they were carried over or they, they've come over from executing the tar process on the remote side on the master server so this looks like what we need the databases a snapshot at a point in time and then we will re-execute this change master statement changing it of course to be 895 and the log file to terminate with 2 instead of 1 so let's re-execute this change master after having started the server on the remote side that's on the slave server so we'll mysql well rc mysql start it'll start and then we'll log in that's mysql prompt and then execute our change master changing it to the new information now that it's changed we'll execute a start slave now that the slave has been started let's go ahead and execute a show slave status and the status shows yes yes in the proper fields looking good here is the name of the file and the offset so all looks well thus far that means replication should be up and running we can execute also a show process list this will reveal whether or not the IO and SQL threads are running and has read all relay log information it's waiting for the master to get new information so replication should have taken place now let's exit temporarily by quitting the slaves terminal monitor and then we'll take a look at the directory to see what files exist here's the relay bin index and here's a relay bin file here's also a new master info and a new relay log info so all is back in place and now the slave server has been updated to really be a mirror of the primary server and we can take this all underscore dbs dot bz2 file and post it to the server that we want to include as a new slave so the new slave server so now this is in place let's connect and just confirm that the user account match and so forth we'll connect with ABC123 we'll show databases we proved that replication initially worked with just the HR database we made a change on one we saw it on the other here are the DBs let's execute a select user comma host comma password from mysql.user 
and you'll see that the same users exist including the recently added user which means if we were to go ahead and drop user on the master side replication should take care of dropping user on the slave side let's go ahead and select user again from the master just to be sure that all is well and everything's identical and then we'll go ahead and drop user and once a drop user is executed on the remote side which is the initial slave server will select user and notice that the user is now gone so replication truly is up and working now for all DBs you may be wondering what if we were to make a change on a different database such as HR well let's show tables and see what we can change we'll select star from employees and let's go ahead and drop the last entry so we'll delete from employees where let's set a criteria F name is equivalent to the name that we specify and we'll follow that up with a select star from employees to ensure that the user has been removed we're back to four users or four employees in the employees table let's return to the slave server and confirm the number of employees by using HR we'll show tables and then select star from employees notice the replication hasn't actually taken effect yet it will momentarily and we'll rerun that query and you'll see that now the employees list has been updated so it took a few seconds but it updated pretty quickly after great so how about configuring replication for a different server since we now know that replication occurs for all tables we can go ahead and set up replication on a different server using the same snapshot let's go to the directory where the snapshot exists and we'll copy it to the Linux CBT serve one server so let's SCP all DBs over to Linux CBT serve one into var lib and we'll keep it one level down we'll accept the public key and we keep it one level down so that we can easily remove the contents of MySQL it's copied so what we'll do is SSH in as root over to Linux CBT serve one and then we'll navigate once we've connected into var lib MySQL here's the directory with the default database we can stop the server and extract the contents of the snapshot so let's execute the service MySQL stop this will shut the server and we'll simply just clean out this directory by removing everything from it so remove RF star then we'll move from one level up the all DBs file into this directory then tar x JVF it this will create a clean structure and we just need to ensure that the permissions are right and the permissions look good because if MySQL doesn't own the database files it won't be able to change them so now we have a new structure which means that we can go ahead and configure replication on the new slave but the new slave doesn't have a server ID set and we have not issued against it a create master or a change master with all of the various directives so let's go ahead and do that we'll modify etc my.cnf if it doesn't exist we'll create it and we'll create a section called mysql d and beneath it we'll set the server id equivalent to 200 since the other one's 100 this is all that's required because the server will not function as a master server in replication mode it will just be a slave once that's set we will start the server and connect to it again we're just going through the steps we set the server ID to a value other than one that already exists we have one 100 and then the new one is 200 so master is one slave one is 100 slave two is 200 once we've connected to the server we're going to execute what you see here we need to of course confirm the position to be sure that we're replicating or picking up from the proper location it should be 895 but on a primary we could do a show master status and it'll tell us the current status and it's set to 1073 so this is what's important so on the remote system let's go ahead and log into MySQL so we'll MySQL P username and password it isn't running so let's start it service MySQL start and once it starts we'll connect 
now we're in we'll show databases of course it shows the databases that we've copied the snapshot but replication isn't set up if we execute a show slave status you'll see nothing's returned so we need to go ahead and execute the statement that we have in memory and of course using 1073 as the new position the file name remains the same the binary logging file name hasn't changed it's still Linux CBT DB1 dot zero 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 two and another note good practice is to ensure that your hosts file has an entry for the primary service let's go ahead and specify 192.168.1.50 linux cbt db1 dot linux cbt dot internal and we'll use the short name as well to be sure that name resolution works well try not to rely upon dns name resolution when using replication since servers seldom change IP addresses, it's ideal to fix the addresses into hosts files. So there actually is a good use for hosts files, and that is on servers. Now that we're back in, let's copy this change master yet again, and the position is 1073, not 1072, but we'll confirm it because this position, the offset in the log file is critical. So let's rerun show master status, and it is 1073. Since it is 1073, we'll copy the entire block. And then, since the grant account that we create, we created earlier on accepts connections from any server, we'll just go ahead and execute it. This has been committed. Again, we'll execute a show slave status. Notice that the columns are set to no, which are typically yes when the processes for both SQL and I.O. are up and running. Well, we haven't executed the start slave, so as a result, the slave is, has not been started and the two I.O. processes are not running. Let's go ahead and execute that. A start slave. We'll start the slave. Then we'll rerun show slave status, and you'll notice that both processes are now running. Yes, yes, set for the I.O. as well as for the SQL process. I.O. is the first, SQL is the second. So this means that if we rerun show slave status, you'll see that it's yes, it persists. And if we run a show process list, you'll see that the process, the I.O. process is waiting for the master to send information. And the SQL process has already read all changes. Super. So now we have configured our environment similar to the model. We have one master, which is set to a process ID of one or server ID that is of one and we have one slave that's set to server ID equal to 100 that's the first slave and the second slave let's configure it its server ID is equal to 200 and of course we need to specify that as well in the master just for clarity server ID is equivalent to one so 1, 100, 200, and you can use any value from 1 through 2 to the 32nd minus 1. So really about 4 billion values are available at your disposal. Now on the slave side, let's go ahead and just ensure that in the varlib MySQL directory, this is the second slave, which happens to be a Red Hat box. In fact, we can cat etc red hat release and you'll see that it's a red hat enterprise 4 box we just want to use a different distro to show you that it is quite possible well lsltr you'll notice that mysql regardless of distribution behaves similarly it has created a relay bin file to store intermediary changes that are to be committed to the local instance and it's also created the index file and a master file and a relay log info file so all is well and all is mirrored and of course the real test is to create users and do things on one side and watch them take effect on the other so for example let's use MySQL and we'll select user host password from the user table here are the four users that are permitted let's run the same query on the second and or the first and second slaves will use H, use MySQL that is leaving the HR context and then execute the query there are the same four users then on the second slave let's log in 
using ABC123. We'll use HR, or use MySQL, that is. Let's execute the same query, and there are the same four users. But one remains because it's a snapshot. So it hasn't actually replicated the differences yet. So this is from the snapshot at the time this particular user existed. Let's go ahead and force replication. We'll create a new user. So let's grant all on star dot star to this particular user new name but with a 2 so that we know it's a new user and we'll set this user to be identified by a similar password now we have a new user on the local system and we need to confirm that this user exists on the remote system let's confirm on slave number one we'll select user host password and notice that the new user has been copied and this user can log in from any host let's confirm on the second slave and notice that the new user has been added one note if a slave database has an extra entry the replication process won't remove that entry especially if the entry was not created on the master so for example this particular user existed but was not replicated and as a result still persists on the slave so the replication process won't just remove the user we could go ahead and drop the user manually from here so let's go ahead and drop user and then a select will reveal that it's identical super so now we have replication up and running it's working for two slaves let's go ahead and export this particular file that we worked on we'll export it as PDF and it'll be in our default directory in fact we have a name we'll just get it from the server let's quit this current instance and we'll look for the PDF file and just give it this particular name and we should be fine it'll overwrite the existing instance and you'll find it in the docs subdirectory on the DVD we'll export all pages and we'll close this particular document super so replication is pretty straightforward it's easy to configure it takes a few steps or well many steps but once it's in place you're up and running and you just repeat the steps for subsequent servers and you know that your data will be on those subsequent servers literally seconds after publishing the changes to the primary server